Enuma Elish, The Babylonian Epic of Creation Tablet 1 When the heavens above did not exist, and earth beneath had not come into being, there was Apsu, the first in order, their begetter, and Demiurge Tiamat, who gave birth to them all. They had mingled their waters together, before meadowland had coalesced and reedbed was to be found, when not one of the gods had been formed or had come into being, when no destinies had been decreed. The gods were created within them. Lachmu and Lahamu were formed and came into being. While they grew and increased in stature, Anshar and Kishar, who excelled them, were created. They prolonged their days, they multiplied their years. Anu, their son, could rival his father's. Anu, the son, equaled Anshar, and Anu begat Nudimut, his own equal. Nudimud was the champion among his fathers, profoundly discerning, wise, of robust strength, very much stronger than his father's begetter Anshar, he had no rival among the gods, his brothers. The divine brothers came together. Their clamor got loud, throwing Tiamat into a turmoil. They jarred the nerves of Tiamat, and by their dancing they spread alarm in Anduruna. Apsu did not diminish their clamor, and Tiamat was silent when confronted with them. Their conduct was displeasing to her, yet though their behavior was not good, she wished to spare them. Thereupon Apsu, the begetter of the great gods, called Mumu, his vizier, and addressed him. Vizier Mumu, who gratifies my pleasure, come, let us go to Tiamat. They went and sat, facing Tiamat, as they conferred about the gods, their sons. Apsu opened his mouth and addressed Tiamat. Their behavior has become displeasing to me, and I cannot rest in the daytime or sleep at night. I will destroy and break up their way of life, that silence may reign and we may sleep. When Tiamat heard this, she raged and cried out to her spouse. She cried in distress, fuming within herself. She grieved over the plotted evil. How can we destroy what we have given birth to? Though their behavior causes distress, let us tighten discipline graciously. Mumu spoke up with counsel for Apsu, as from a rebellious vizier was the counsel of his Mumu. Destroy, my father, that lawless way of life, that you may rest in the daytime and sleep by night. Apsu was pleased with him. His face beamed because he had plotted evil against the gods, his sons. Mumu put his arms around Apsu's neck. He sat on his knees, kissing him. What they plotted in their gathering was reported to the gods, their sons. The gods heard it and were frantic. They were overcome with silence and sat quietly. Ea, who excels in knowledge, the skilled and learned, Ea, who knows everything, perceived their tricks. He fashioned it and made it to be all-embracing. He executed it skillfully as supreme, his pure incantation. He recited it and set it on the waters. He poured sleep upon him as he was slumbering deeply. He put Apsu to slumber as he poured out sleep, and Mumu the counselor was breathless with agitation. He split Apsu's sinews, ripped off his crown, carried away his aura, and put it on himself. He bound Apsu and killed him. Mumu he confined and handled roughly. He set his dwelling upon Apsu and laid hold on Mumu, keeping the nose rope in his hand. After Ea had bound and slain his enemies, had achieved victory over his foes, he rested quietly in his chamber. He called it Apsu, whose shrines he appointed. Then he founded his living quarters within it, and Ea and Damkina, his wife, sat in splendor.
in the chamber of the destinies, the room of the archetypes, the wisest of the wise, the sage of the gods, Baal, was conceived. In Apsu was Marduk born. In pure Apsu was Marduk born. Ea his father begat him. Damkina his mother bore him. He sucked the breasts of goddesses. A nurse reared him and filled him with terror. His figure was well developed. The glance of his eyes was dazzling. His growth was manly. He was mighty from the beginning. Anu, his father's begetter, saw him. He exulted and smiled, his heart filled with joy. Anu rendered him perfect. His divinity was remarkable, and he became very lofty, excelling them in his attributes. His members were incomprehensibly wonderful, incapable of being grasped with the mind, hard even to look on. Four were his eyes, four his ears. Flame shot forth as he moved his lips. His four ears grew large, and his eyes likewise took in everything. His figure was lofty and superior in comparison with the gods. His limbs were surpassing. His nature was superior. Mari Utu, Mari Utu, the sun, the sun god, the sun god of the gods. He was clothed with the aura of the ten gods. So exalted was his strength. The fifty dreads were loaded upon him. Anu formed and gave birth to the four winds. He delivered them to him. My son, let them whirl. He formed dust and set a hurricane to drive it. He made a wave to bring consternation on Tiamat. Tiamat was confounded. Day and night she was frantic. The gods took no rest. They, in their minds, they plotted evil and addressed their mother, Tiamat. When Apsu, your spouse, was killed, you did not go at his side but sat quietly. The four dreadful winds have been fashioned to throw you into confusion, and we cannot sleep. You gave no thought to Apsu, your spouse, nor to Mumu, who is a prisoner. Now you sit alone. Henceforth you will be in frantic consternation, and as for us who cannot rest, you do not love us. Consider our burden. Our eyes are hollow. Break the immovable yoke that we may sleep. Make battle. Avenge them. Reduce to nothingness. Tiamat heard. The speech pleased her. She said, Let us make demons as you have advised. The gods assembled within her. They conceived evil against the gods, their begetters. They, and took the side of Tiamat. Fiercely plotting, unresting by night and day, lusting for battle, raging, storming, they set up a host to bring about conflict. Mother Huber, who forms everything, supplied irresistible weapons and gave birth to giant serpents. They had sharp teeth. They were merciless. With poison instead of blood she filled their bodies. She clothed the fearful monsters with dread. She loaded them with an aura and made them godlike. She said, Let their onlooker feebly perish. May they constantly leap forward and never retire. She created the hydra, the dragon, the hairy hero, the great demon, the savage dog, and the scorpion man, fierce demons, the fish man, and the bull man, carriers of merciless weapons, fearless in the face of battle. Her commands were tremendous, not to be resisted. Although she made eleven of that kind, among the gods her sons, whom she constituted her host, she exalted Chingu and magnified him among them. The leadership of the army, the direction of the host, the bearing of weapons, campaigning, the mobilization of conflict, the chief executive power of battle, supreme command, she entrusted to him and set him on a throne. I have cast the spell for you and exalted you in the host of the gods. I have delivered to you the rule of all the gods. 
You are indeed exalted, my spouse. You are renowned. Let your commands prevail over all the Anunnaki. She gave him the tablet of destinies and fastened it to his breast, saying, Your order may not be changed. Let the utterance of your mouth be firm. After Chingu was elevated and had acquired the power of Anu ship, he decreed the destinies for the gods, her sons. May the utterance of your mouths subdue the fire god. May your poison by its accumulation put down aggression. Tablet 2 Tiamat gathered together her creation and organized battle against the gods, her offspring. Henceforth Tiamat plotted evil because of Apsu. It became known to Ea that she had arranged the conflict. Ea heard this matter. He lapsed into silence in his chamber and sat motionless. After he had reflected and his anger had subsided, he directed his steps to Anshar, his father. He entered the presence of the father of his begetter, Anshar, and related to him all of Tiamat's plotting. My father, Tiamat, our mother, has conceived a hatred for us. She has established a host in her savage fury. All the gods have turned to her. Even those you begat also take her side. They... and took the side of Tiamat, fiercely plotting, unresting by night and day, lusting for battle, raging, storming. They set up a host to bring about conflict. Mother Huber, who forms everything, supplied irresistible weapons and gave birth to giant serpents. They had sharp teeth. They were merciless. With poison instead of blood she filled their bodies. She clothed the fearful monsters with dread. She loaded them with an aura and made them godlike, she said, Let their onlooker feebly perish. May they constantly leap forward and never retire. She created the hydra, the dragon, the hairy hero, the great demon, the savage dog, and the scorpion man, fierce demons, the fish man, and the bull man, carriers of merciless weapons, fearless in the face of battle. Her commands were tremendous, not to be resisted. Although she made eleven of that kind, among the gods her sons whom she constituted her host, she exalted Chingu and magnified him among them. The leadership of the army, the direction of the host, the bearing of weapons, campaigning, the mobilization of conflict, the chief executive power of battle, supreme command, she entrusted to him and set him on a throne. I have cast the spell for you, and exalted you in the host of the gods. I have delivered to you the rule of all the gods. You are indeed exalted, my spouse. You are renowned. Let your commands prevail over all the Anunnaki. She gave him the tablet of destinies, and fastened it to his breast, saying, Your order may not be changed. Let the utterance of your mouth be firm." After Chingu was elevated and had acquired the power of Anuship, he decreed the destinies for the gods, her sons. May the utterance of your mouths subdue the fire god. May your poison by its accumulation put down aggression. Anchar heard. The matter was profoundly disturbing. He cried, Woe! and bit his lip. His heart was in fury. His mind could not be calmed. Over Ea his son, his cry was faltering. My son, you who provoked the war, take responsibility for whatever you alone have done. You set out and killed Apsu. And as for Tiamat, whom you made furious, where is her equal? The gatherer of counsel, the learned prince, the creator of wisdom, the god Nudimud, with soothing words and calming utterance, Gently answered his father, Anshar. My father, deep mind who decrees destiny, who has the power to bring into being and destroy, Anshar, deep mind who decrees destiny, who has the power to bring into being and to destroy, I want to say something to you. Calm down for me for a moment and consider that I performed a helpful deed. 
Before I killed Apsu, who could have seen the present situation? Before I quickly made an end of him, what were the circumstances were I to destroy him? Anshar heard. The words pleased him. His heart relaxed to speak to Ea. My son, your deeds are fitting for a god. You are capable of a fierce, unequaled blow. Ea, your deeds are fitting for a god. You are capable of a fierce, unequaled blow. Go before Tiamat and appease her attack, her fury with your incantation. He heard the speech of Anshar, his father. He took the road to her, proceeded on the route to her. He went. He perceived the tricks of Tiamat. He stopped, fell silent, and turned back. He entered the presence of Anshar, the father who begat him, penitently addressing him. My father, Tiamat's deeds are too much for me. I perceived her planning, but my incantation was not equal to it. Her strength is mighty. She is full of dread. She is altogether very strong. No one can go against her. Her very loud noise does not diminish. I became afraid of her cry and turned back. My father, do not lose hope. Send another person against her. Though a woman's strength is very great, it is not equal to a man's. Disband her cohorts. Break up her plans before she lays her hands on us. Anshar lapsed into silence, staring at the ground. He nodded to Ea, shaking his head. The Igigi and all the Anunnaki had assembled. They sat in tight-lipped silence. No god would go to face, would go out against Tiamat. Yet the Lord Anshar, the father of the great gods, was angry in his heart and did not summon anyone. A mighty son, the avenger of his father, he who hastens to war, the warrior Marduk. Ea summoned him to his private chamber to explain to him his plans. Marduk, give counsel. Listen to your father. You are my son who gives me pleasure. Go reverently before Anshar. Speak. Take your stand. Appease him with your glance. Be'el rejoiced at his father's words. He drew near and stood in the presence of Anshar. Anshar saw him, his heart filled with satisfaction. He kissed his lips and removed his fear. My father, do not hold your peace, but speak forth. I will go and fulfill your desires. Anshar, do not hold your peace, but speak forth. I will go and fulfill your desires. Which man has drawn up his battle array against you? And will Tiamat, who is a woman, attack you with her weapons? My father, beget her. Rejoice and be glad. Soon you will tread on the neck of Tiamat. Anshar, beget her. Rejoice and be glad. Soon you will tread on the neck of Tiamat. Go, my son, conversant with all knowledge. Appease Tiamat with your pure spell. Drive the storm chariot without delay. And with a, which cannot be repelled, turn her back. Baal rejoiced at his father's words, with glad heart he addressed his father. Lord of the gods, destiny of the great gods, if I should become your avenger, if I should bind Tiamat and preserve you, convene an assembly and proclaim for me an exalted destiny. Sit, all of you, in Upshuk Kenaku with gladness, and let me, with my utterance, decree destinies instead of you. Whatever I instigate must not be changed, nor may my command be nullified or altered. Tablet 3 Anshar opened his mouth and addressed Kaka, his vizier. Vizier Kaka, who gratifies my pleasure, I will send you to Lakmu and Laamu. You are skilled in making inquiry, learned in address. Have the gods my fathers brought to my presence, let all the gods be brought. Let them confer as they sit at table. Let them eat grain. Let them drink ale. 
Let them decree the destiny for Marduk, their avenger. Go, be gone, Kaka. Stand before them and repeat to them all that I tell you. Anshar, your son, has sent me, and I am to explain his plans. I sent Anu, but he could not face her. Nudimut took fright and retired. Marduk, the sage of the gods, your son, has come forward. He has determined to meet Tiamat. He has spoken to me and said, Quickly now, decree your destiny for him without delay, that he may go and face your powerful enemy. Kaka went. He directed his steps to Lahmu and Lahamu, the gods his fathers. He prostrated himself. He kissed the ground before them. He got up, saying to them he stood. When Lahaha and Lahamu heard, they cried aloud. All the Igiji moaned in distress. What has gone wrong, that she took this decision about us? We did not know what Tiamat was doing. All the great gods who decreed destinies gathered as they went. They entered the presence of Anshar, and they became filled with joy. They kissed one another as they, in the assembly, they conferred as they sat at table. They ate grain. They drank ale. They strained the sweet liquor through their straws. As they drank beer and felt good, they became quite carefree. Their mood was merry, and they decreed the fate for Marduk, their avenger. Tablet 4 They set a lordly dais for him and he took his seat before his fathers to receive kingship. They said, You are the most honored among the great gods. Your destiny is unequaled. Your command is like Anu's. Marduk, you are the most honored among the great gods. Your destiny is unequaled. Your command is like Anu's. Henceforth your order will not be annulled. It is in your power to exalt and abase. Your utterance is sure. Your command cannot be rebelled against. None of the gods will transgress the line you draw. Shrines for all the gods needs provisioning, that you may be established where their sanctuaries are. You are Marduk, our avenger. We have given you kingship over the sum of the whole universe. Take your seat in the assembly. Let your word be exalted. Let your weapons not miss the mark, but may they slay your enemies. Baal, spare him who trusts in you, but destroy the god who set his mind on evil. They set a constellation in the middle and addressed Marduk, their son. Your destiny, Baal, is superior to that of all the gods. Command and bring about annihilation and recreation. Let the constellation disappear at your utterance, with a second command, let the constellation reappear. He gave the command, and the constellation disappeared. With a second command, the constellation came into being again. When the gods his fathers saw the effect of his utterance, they rejoiced and offered congratulation. Marduk is the king! They addressed to him a mace, a throne, and a rod. They gave him an irresistible weapon that overwhelms the foe. They said, Go, cut Tiamat's throat, and let the winds bear up her blood to give the news. The gods, his fathers, decreed the destiny of Baal, and set him on the road, the way of prosperity and success. He fashioned a bow and made it his weapon. He set an arrow in place, put the bowstring on. He took up his club and held it in his right hand. His bow and quiver he hung at his side. He placed lightning before him and filled his body with tongues of flame. He made a net to enmesh the entrails of Tiamat and stationed the four winds that no part of her escape. The south wind, the north wind, the east wind, the west wind. He put beside his net winds given by his father, Anu. He fashioned the evil wind, the dust storm, tempest, the fourfold wind, the sevenfold wind, 
the chaos spreading wind, the wind. He set out the seven winds that he had fashioned, and they took their stand behind him to harass Tiamat's entrails. Baal took up the storm flood, his great weapon. He rode the fearful chariot of the irresistible storm. Four steeds he yoked to it and harnessed them to it, the destroyer, the merciless, the trampler, the fleet. Their lips were parted, their teeth bore venom. They were strangers to weariness, trained to sweep forward. At his right hand he stationed raging battle and strife. On the left, conflict that overwhelms a united battle array. He was clad in a tunic, a fearful coat of mail, and on his head he wore an aura of terror. Baal proceeded and set out on his way. He set his face toward the raging Tiamat. In his lips he held a spell. He grasped a plant to counter poison in his hand. Thereupon they milled around him. The gods milled around him. The gods, his fathers, milled around him. The gods milled around him. Baal drew near, surveying the maw of Tiamat. He observed the tricks of Chingu, her spouse. As he looked, he lost his nerve. His determination went, and he faltered. His divine aides, who were marching at his side, saw the warrior, the foremost, and their vision became dim. Tiamat cast her spell without turning her neck. In her lips she held untruth and lies. In there they have assembled by you. Baal lifted up the storm flood, his great weapon, and with these words threw it at the raging Tiamat. Why are you aggressive and arrogant and strive to provoke battle? The younger generation have shouted, outraging their elders, but you, their mother, hold pity in contempt. Chingu you have named to be your spouse, and you have improperly appointed him to the rank of Anu ship. Against Anshar, king of the gods, you have stirred up trouble, and against the gods, my fathers, your trouble is established. Deploy your troops, gird on your weapons, you and I will take our stand and do battle. When Tiamat heard this, she went insane and lost her reason. Tiamat cried aloud and fiercely. All her lower members trembled beneath her. She was reciting an incantation, kept reciting her spell while the battle gods were sharpening their weapons of war. Tiamat and Marduk, the sage of the gods, came together, joining in strife, drawing near to battle. Baal spread out his net and enmeshed her. He let loose the evil wind, the rear guard, in her face. Tiamat opened her mouth to swallow it. She let the evil wind in so that she could not close her lips. The fierce winds weighed down her belly. Her inwards were distended, and she opened her mouth wide. He let fly an arrow and pierced her belly. He tore open her entrails and slit her inwards. He bound her and extinguished her life. He threw down her corpse and stood on it. After he had killed Tiamat, the leader, her assembly dispersed, her host scattered. Her divine aides who went beside her in trembling and fear beat a retreat to save their lives. But they were completely surrounded, unable to escape. He bound them and broke their weapons, and they lay enmeshed, sitting in a snare, hiding in corners filled with grief, bearing his punishment held in a prison, the eleven creatures who were laden with fearfulness, the throng of devils who went as grooms at her right hand. He put ropes upon them and bound their arms. Together with their warfare, he trampled them beneath him. Now Chingu, who had risen to power among them, he bound and reckoned with the dead gods. He took from him the Tablet of Destinies, which was not properly his, sealed it with a seal, and fastened it to his own breast. After the warrior Marduk had bound and slain his enemies, had, the arrogant enemy, had established victory for Anshar over all his foes, 
had fulfilled the desire of Nudimud, he strengthened his hold on the bound gods and returned to Tiamat, whom he had bound. Baal placed his feet on the lower parts of Tiamat and with his merciless club smashed her skull. He severed her arteries and let the north wind bear up her blood to give the news. His fathers saw it and were glad and exulted. They brought gifts and presents to him. Baal rested, surveying the corpse. In order to divide the lump by a clever scheme, he split her into two like a dried fish. One half of her he set up and stretched out as the heavens. He stretched the skin and appointed a watch, with the instruction not to let her waters escape. He crossed over the heavens, surveyed the celestial parts, and adjusted them to match the Apsu, Nudimid's abode. Baal measured the shape of the Apsu and set up Eshara, a replica of Eshgala. In Eshgala, Eshara which he had built, and the heavens, he settled in their shrines Anu, and Leel, and Ea. Tablet 5 He fashioned heavenly stations for the great gods and set up constellations, the patterns of the stars. He appointed the year, marked off divisions, and set up three stars each for the twelve months. After he had organized the year, he established the heavenly station of Neberu to fix the stars' intervals, that none should transgress or be slothful, he fixed the heavenly stations of Enlil and Ea with it. Gates he opened on both sides, and put strong bolts at the left and the right. He placed the heights of heaven in her, Tiamat's, belly. He created Nanar, and trusting to him, the night. He appointed him as the jewel of the night to fix the days, and month by month without ceasing he elevated him with a crown saying, Shine over the land at the beginning of the month, resplendent with horns to fix six days. On the seventh day the crown will be half size. On the fifteenth day, halfway through each month, stand in opposition. When Shamash sees you on the horizon, diminish in the proper stages and shine backwards. On the twenty-ninth day, draw near to the path of Shamash. The thirtieth day, stand in conjunction and rival Shamash. I have the sign. Follow its track. Draw near. Give judgment. Shamash, constrain murder and violence. Me. At the end, let there be the twenty-ninth day. After he had the decrees, the organization of front, and he made the day. Let the year be equally at the new year. The year, let there be regularly the projecting bolt after he had the watches of night and day, the foam which Tiamat Marduk fashioned, he gathered it together and made it into clouds, the raging of the winds, violent rainstorms, the billowing of mist, the accumulation of her spittle. He appointed for himself and took them in his hand. He put her head in position and poured out. He opened the abyss, and it was sated with water. From her two eyes he let the Euphrates and Tigris flow. He blocked her nostrils, but left. He heaped up the distant mountains of her breasts. He bored wells to channel the springs. He twisted her tail and wove it into the Dormahu, the Apsu beneath his feet. He set up her crotch. It wedged up the heavens. Thus, the half of her, he stretched out and made it firm as the earth. After he had finished his work inside Tiamat, he spread his net and let it right out. He surveyed the heavens and the earth, their bonds. 
after he had formulated his regulations and composed his decrees, he attached guide ropes and put them in Ea's hands. The tablet of destinies which Chingu had taken and carried, he took charge of it as a trophy and presented it to Anu. The of battle, of which he had tied on or had put on his head, he brought before his fathers. Now the eleven creatures to which Tiamat had given birth and... He broke their weapons and bound them, the creatures, to his feet. He made images of them and stationed them at the gate of the Apsu, to be a sign, never to be forgotten. The gods saw it and were jubilantly happy. That is, Lachmu, Lahamu, and all his fathers. Anshar embraced him and published abroad his title, Victorious King. Anu, Enlil, and Ea gave him gifts. Mother Damkina, who bore him, hailed him. With a clean, festal robe she made his face shine. To Usmu, who held her present to give the news, he entrusted the vizierate of the Apsu and the care of the holy places. The Agigi assembled, and all did obeisance to him. Every one of the Anunnaki was kissing his feet, they all gathered to show their submission. They stood, they bowed down, behold the king, his fathers, and took their fill of his beauty. Baal listened to their utterance, being girded with the dust of battle, anointing his body with cedar perfume. He clothed himself in his lordly robe with a crown of terror, as a royal aura, he took up his club and held it in his right hand. He grasped in his left. He set his feet. He put upon the scepter of prosperity and success he hung at his side. After he had the aura, he adorned his sack, the apsu, with a fearful was settled like, in his throne room, in his cella, every one of the gods, Lachmu and Lahamu, opened their mouths and addressed the Igigi gods. Previously Marduk was our beloved son. Now he is your king. Heed his command. Next they all spoke up together. His name is Lugal Dimaran Kia. Trust in him. When they had given kingship to Marduk, they addressed to him a benediction for prosperity and success. Henceforth you are the caretaker of our shrine. Whatever you command, we will do. Marduk opened his mouth to speak and addressed the gods his fathers. Above the Apsu, the emerald abode, opposite Ashara, which I built for you, Beneath the celestial parts, whose floor I made firm, I will build a house to be my luxurious abode. Within it I will establish its shrine. I will found my chamber and establish my kingship. When you come up from the Apsu to make a decision, this will be your resting place before the assembly. When you descend from heaven to make a decision, this will be your resting place before the assembly. I shall call its name Babylon, the homes of the great gods. Within it we will hold a festival. That will be the evening festival. The gods, his fathers, heard this speech of his. They said, With regard to all that your hands have made, who has your? With regard to the earth that your hands have made, who has your? In Babylon, as you have named it, put our resting place forever. Let them, our, bring regular offerings. Whoever our tasks which we, therein its toil, they rejoiced, the gods, he who knows them. He opened his mouth, showing them light. 
his speech. He made wide them. And the gods bowed down, speaking to him. They addressed Lugaldimaran Kia, their lord. Formerly, lord, you were our beloved son. Now you are our king, he who preserved us. The aura of club and scepter. Let him conceive plans that we Tablet 6. When Marduk heard the god's speech, he conceived a desire to accomplish clever things. He opened his mouth, addressing Ea. He counsels that which he has pondered in his heart. I will bring together blood to form bone. I will bring into being Lulu, whose name shall be man. I will create Lulu, man on whom the toil of the gods will be laid, that they may rest. I will skillfully alter the organization of the gods. Though they are honored as one, they shall be divided into two. Ea answered as he addressed a word to him, expressing his comments on the resting of the gods. Let one brother of theirs be given up. Let him perish, that people may be fashioned. Let the great gods assemble, and let the guilty one be given up, that they may be confirmed. Marduk assembled the great gods. Using gracious direction as he gave his order, as he spoke, the gods heeded him. The king addressed a word to the Anunnaki. Your former oath was true indeed. Now, also, tell me the solemn truth. Who is the one who instigated warfare? who made Tiamat rebel and set battle in motion. Let him who instigated warfare be given up, that I may lay his punishment on him, but you sit and rest. The Agigi, the great gods, answered him, that is, Lugaldimaran Kia, the counselor of the gods, the Lord. Chingu is the one who instigated warfare, who made Tiamat rebel and set battle in motion. They bound him holding him before Ea. They inflicted the penalty on him and severed his blood vessels. From his blood, he, Ea, created mankind, on whom he imposed the service of the gods and set the gods free. After the wise Ea had created mankind and had imposed the service of the gods upon them, that task is beyond comprehension, for new Dimud performed the creation with the skill of Marduk. King Marduk divided the gods, all the Anunnaki, into upper and lower groups. He assigned three hundred in the heavens to guard the decrees of Anu, and appointed them as a guard. Next he arranged the organization of the netherworld. In heaven and netherworld he stationed six hundred gods. After he had arranged all the decrees and had distributed incomes among the Anunnaki of heaven and netherworld, the Anunnaki opened their mouths and addressed their lord Marduk. Now, lord, seeing you have established our freedom, what favor can we do for you? Let us make a shrine of great renown. Your chamber will be our resting place wherein we may repose. Let us erect a shrine to house a pedestal wherein we may repose when we finish the work. When Marduk heard this, he beamed as brightly as the light of day. Build Babylon, the task you have sought. Let bricks for it be molded and raise the shrine. The Anunnaki wielded the pick. For one year they made the needed bricks. When the second year arrived, they raised the peak of Esagil a replica of the Apsu. They built the lofty temple tower of the Apsu, and for Anu and Lil and Ea, they established it as a dwelling. He sat in splendor before them, surveying its horns, which were level with the base of Eshara. After they had completed the work on Esagil, all the Anunnaki constructed their own shrines, three hundred Igigi of heaven and six hundred of the Apsu, all of them, had assembled. 
Baal seated the gods, his fathers, at the banquet, in the lofty shrine which they had built for his dwelling, saying, This is Babylon, your fixed dwelling. Take your pleasure here. Sit down in joy. The great gods sat down. Beer mugs were set out, and they sat at the banquet. After they had enjoyed themselves inside, they held a service in awesome Essegil. The regulations and all the rules were confirmed. All the gods divided the stations of heaven and netherworld. The college of the fifty great gods took their seats. The seven gods of destinies were appointed to give decisions. Baal received his weapon, the bow, and laid it before them. His divine fathers saw the net which he had made. His fathers saw how skillfully wrought was the structure of the bow, as they praised what he had made. Anu lifted it up in the divine assembly. He kissed the bow, saying, It is my daughter. Thus he called the names of the bow. Longstick was the first. The second was, May it hit the mark. With the third name, Bow Star, he made it to shine in the sky. He fixed its heavenly position along with its divine brothers. After Anu had decreed the destiny of the bow, he set down a royal throne, a lofty one even for a god. Anu set it there in the assembly of the gods, the great gods assembled. They exalted the destiny of Marduk and did obeisance. They invoked a curse on themselves, and took an oath with water and oil, and put their hands to their throats. They granted him the right to exercise kingship over the gods. They confirmed him as lord of the gods of heaven and netherworld. Anshar gave him his exalted name, Asaluhi. At the mention of his name let us show submission. When he speaks, let the gods heed him. Let his command be superior in upper and lower regions. May the Son, our Avenger, be exalted. Let his lordship be superior, and himself without rival. Let him shepherd the blackheads, his creatures. Let them tell of his character to future days without forgetting. Let him establish lavish food offerings for his fathers. Let him provide for their maintenance and be caretaker of their sanctuaries. Let him burn incense to rejoice their sanctums. Let him do on earth the same as he has done in heaven. Let him appoint the blackheads to worship him. The subject humans should take note and call on their gods, since he commands they should heed their goddesses. Let food offerings be brought for their gods and goddesses. May they not be forgotten. May they remember their gods. May they, their, may they, their shrines. Though the blackheads worship someone, some another god, he is the god of each and every one of us. Come, let us call the fifty names of him whose character is resplendent, whose achievement is the same, Marduk as he was named by his father Anu from his birth, who supplies pasturage and watering, making the stables flourish, who bound the boastful with his weapon, the storm flood, and saved the gods his fathers from distress. He is the sun, the sun god of the gods. He is dazzling. Let them ever walk in his bright light. On the peoples that he created, the living beings, he imposed the service of the gods, and they took rest. Creation and annihilation, forgiveness and exacting the penalty, occur at his command. So let them fix their eyes on him. Marukka, he is the god who created them, who put the Anunnaki at ease, the Egiji at rest. Marutukku, he is the support of land city, and its peoples. Henceforth let the peoples ever heed him. Mershakushu, fierce yet deliberating, angry yet relenting, his mind is wide, his heart is all-embracing. Lugal Dimarankia is the name by which we all called him, whose command we have exalted above that of the gods his fathers. 
He is the Lord of all the gods of heaven and nether world, the king at whose injunctions the gods in upper and lower regions shudder. Nari Lugaldimer Ankia is the name we gave him, the mentor of every god, who established our dwellings in heaven and netherworld in time of trouble, who distributed the heavenly stations between Igiji and Anunnaki. Let the gods tremble at his name and quake on their seats. Asaluhi is the name by which his father Anu called him. He is the light of the gods, a mighty hero, who, as his name says, is a protecting angel for God and land, who, by a terrible combat, saved our dwelling in time of trouble. Asaluhi Namtilla they called him secondly, the life-giving God, who, in accordance with the form of his name, restored all the ruined gods, the Lord who brought to life the dead gods by his pure incantation. Let us praise him as the destroyer of the crooked enemies, Asaluhi Namru, as his name is called thirdly, the pure god who cleanses our character. Anshar, Lachmu, and Lahamu each called him by three of his names. Then they addressed the gods, their sons. We have each called him by three of his names, now you call his names, like us. The gods rejoiced as they heard their speech. In Upshuuk Kinaki they held a conference. Of the warrior son, our avenger. Of the provisioner, let us extol the name. They sat down in their assembly, summoning the destinies, and with all due rites they called his name. Tablet 7 Asare, the giver of arable land who established plough land, the creator of barley and flax who made plant life grow. Asaralim, who is revered in the council chamber, whose council excels. The gods heed it and grasp fear of him. Asaralim Nuna, the noble, the light of the father, his begetter, who directs the decrees of Anu, Enlil, and Ea, that is Ninshiku. He is their provisioner, who assigns their incomes, whose turban multiplies abundance for the land. Tutu is he, who accomplishes their renovation. Let him purify their sanctuaries that they may repose. Let him fashion an incantation that the gods may rest. Though they rise up in fury, let them withdraw. He is indeed exalted in the assembly of the gods, his fathers. No one among the gods can equal him. Tutuziukina, the life of his host, who established the pure heavens for the gods, who took charge of their courses, who appointed their stations, may he not be forgotten among mortals, but let them remember his deeds. Tutuziku, they called him thirdly, the establisher of purification, the god of the pleasant breeze, lord of success and obedience, who produces bounty and wealth, who establishes abundance, who turns everything scant that we have into profusion, whose pleasant breeze we sniffed in times of terrible trouble. Let men command that his praises be constantly uttered. Let them offer worship, to him. As Tutu Agaku, fourthly, let humans extol him, Lord of the pure incantation, who brought the dead back to life, who showed mercy on the bound gods, who threw the imposed yoke on the gods, his enemies, and to spare them created mankind, the merciful, in whose power it is to restore to life. Let his words be sure and not forgotten from the mouths of the blackheads his creatures. As Tututuku, fifthly, let their mouth give expression to his pure spell, who extirpated all the wicked by his pure incantation. Shazu, who knew the heart of the gods, who saw the rains, who did not let an evildoer escape from him, who established the assembly of the gods, who rejoiced their hearts, who subjugated the disobedient. He is the gods' encompassing protection. 
He made truth to prosper. He uprooted perverse speech. He separated falsehood from truth. As Shazuzizi, secondly, let them continually praise him, the subduer of aggressors, who ousted consternation of from the bodies of the gods, his fathers, Shazu Su Rim, thirdly, who extirpated every foe with his weapons, who confounded their plans and turned them into wind. He snuffed out all the wicked who came against him. Let the gods ever shout acclamations in the assembly. Shazu Su Gurim, fourthly, who established success for the gods, his fathers, who extirpated foes and destroyed their offspring, who scattered their achievements, leaving no part of them. Let his name be spoken and proclaimed in the land. As Shazu Zahrim, fifthly, let future generations discuss him, the destroyer of every rebel, of all the disobedient, who brought all the fugitive gods into the shrines, let this name of his be established. As Shasu Zahgurim, sixthly, let them altogether and everywhere worship him, who himself destroyed all the foes in battle. Enbilulu is he, the Lord who supplies them abundantly, their great chosen one, who provides cereal offerings, who keeps pasturage and watering in good condition, and established it for the land, who opened water courses and distributed plentiful water. Enbilulu Epadun, Lord of Common Land, and let them call him secondly, Canal Supervisor of Heaven and Netherworld, who sets the furrow, who establishes clean arable land in the open country, who directs irrigation ditch and canal and marks out the furrow. As Enbilulu Gugal, Canal Supervisor of the Water Courses of the Gods, let them praise him thirdly, Lord of Abundance, Profusion, and Huge Stores of Grain, who provides bounty, who enriches human habitations, who gives wheat and brings grain into being. Enbilulu Hegal, who accumulates abundance for the peoples, who rains down riches on the broad earth and supplies abundant vegetation. Sir Sir, who heaped up a mountain on top of Tiamat, who plundered the corpse of Tiamat with his weapons, the guardian of the land, their trustworthy shepherd, whose hair is a growing crop, whose turban is a furrow, who kept crossing the broad sea in his fury and kept crossing over the place of her battle as though it were a bridge. Sir Sir Mala, they named him secondly, so be it. Tiamat was his boat, he was her sailor. Gil, whoever heaps up piles of barley, massive mounds, the creator of grain and flocks, who gives seed for the land. Gilima, who made the bond of the gods firm, who created stability, a snare that overwhelmed them, who yet extended favors. Agalima, the lofty, who snatches off the crown, who takes charge of snow, who created the earth on the water and made firm the height of heaven. Zulum, who assigns meadows for the gods and divides up what he has created, who gives incomes and food offerings, who administers shrines. Mumu, creator of heaven and underworld, who protects refugees, the god who purifies heaven and underworld, secondly Zulummu, in respect of whose strength none other among the gods can equal him. Gishnumunab, creator of all the peoples, who made the world regions, who destroyed Tiamat's gods and made peoples from part of them. Lugal Abdubur, the king who scattered the works of Tiamat, who uprooted her weapons, whose foundation is secure on the fore and aft. Pagal Guena, foremost of all lords, whose strength is exalted, who is the greatest among the gods, his brothers, the most noble of them all. Lugal Durmach, king of the bond of the gods, lord of Durmach U, who is the greatest in the royal abode, infinitely more lofty than the other gods. Aranuna, counselor of Ea, 
creator of the gods, his fathers, whom no god can equal in respect of his lordly walk. Dumuduku, who renews for himself in his pure abode in Duku. Dumuduku, without whom Lugalduku does not make a decision. Lugal Shuana, the king whose strength is exalted among the gods, the lord, the strength of Anu, he who is supreme, chosen of Anshar. Iruga, who plundered them all in the sea, who grasps all wisdom, is comprehensive in understanding. Irchingu, who plundered Chingu in battle, who directs all decrees and establishes lordship. Kinma, the director of all the gods, who gives counsel, at whose name the gods bend down in reverence, as before a hurricane. Dingir Esiskur, let him take his lofty seat in the house of benediction. Let the gods bring their presence before him until he receives their offerings. No one but he accomplishes clever things. The four regions of blackheads are his creation. Apart from him, no god knows the measure of their days. Giru, who makes weapons hard, who accomplished clever things in the battle with Tiamat, comprehensive in wisdom, skilled in understanding, a deep mind that all the gods combined do not understand. Let Adu be his name. Let him cover the whole span of heaven. Let him thunder with his pleasant voice upon the earth. May the rumble fill the clouds and give sustenance to the peoples below. Asharu, who, as his name says, mustered the divine fates, he indeed is the warden of absolutely all peoples. As Neberu let him hold the crossing place of heaven and underworld, they should not cross above or below, but should wait for him. Neberu is his star, which he caused to shine in the sky. Let him take his stand on the heavenly staircase, that they may look at him. Yes, he who constantly crosses the sea without resting, let his name be Neberu, who grasps her middle. Let him fix the paths of the stars of heaven. Let him shepherd all the gods like sheep. Let him bind Tiamat and put her life in mortal danger. To generations yet unborn, to distant future days, may he continue unchecked. May he persist into eternity. Since he created the heavens and fashioned the earth, Enlil, the father, called him by his own name, Lord of the Lands. Ea heard the names which all the Igigi called, and his spirit became radiant. Why, he whose name was extolled by his fathers, let him, like me, be called Ea. Let him control the sum of all my rights. Let him administer all my decrees with the word fifty. The great gods called his fifty names and assigned him an outstanding position. They should be remembered. A leading figure should expound them. The wise and learned should confer about them. A father should repeat them and teach them to his son. One should explain them to shepherd and herdsmen. If one is not negligent to Marduk, the Enlil of the gods, may one's land flourish and oneself prosper. For his word is reliable, his command unchanged. No god can alter the utterance of his mouth. When he looks in fury, he does not relent. When his anger is ablaze, no god can face him. His mind is deep, his spirit is all-embracing. Before whom sin and transgression are sought out. Instruction which a leading figure repeated before him. Marduk. He wrote it down, and stored it so that generations to come might hear it. Marduk, who created the Igigi gods, though they diminish, let them call on his name. The Song of Marduk, who defeated Tiamat and took kingship.